The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. And welcome back again, wrestling fans. Jason Bryan here with you, Hall of Fame wrestling writer, broadcaster, and announcer. This is the Short Time Wrestling Podcast. News, reviews, previews, and interviews from the notable names in and around the sport of wrestling. Big one today, and it, it, it's big because this is Menlo College big. And Menlo College is not big. It's 745 students enrolled in undergraduate studies there in Atherton, California. Joey Barang is the guest. He is the head women's coach. Of the Oaks, this school won its first national championship in any sport with a Women's Collegiate Wrestling Association national championship a week ago outside of the perimeter in Marietta, Georgia. Of course, the perimeter being uh, the interstate that surrounds Atlanta. It's kind of a thing for people that live there in the Peach State. But I got a chance to talk with Joey. First time I've ever talked to him. I'm familiar with the Menlo College program. And having covered women's college wrestling for a long time and, and women's freestyle wrestling as a whole. So that is the focus of this episode. A couple things you should be focused on when it comes to the NCAA Division One Wrestling Championships. And that is my preview guide. That is the best accompaniment you can have for anything related to the NCAA Division One Wrestling Championships coming up at PPG Paints Arena in PGH. That's Pittsburgh. So if you have a fantasy league, if you have a pick'em contest, if you have a bracket challenge, if you have a unseated nationals, if you have a seated nationals, if you have any type of contest that involves making picks of athletes needing to know records, scores, bonus victories, things of that nature. Yes, I have you covered. WrestlingPreviewGuide.com slash JB. That will get the podcast $5 discount. This thing retails for $19.99. Why is a digital Preview Guide 1999 because it's almost 200 pages of sheer unbridled excellence. Facts, stats, details. There's all sorts of trivia games. If, if you've got one of these situations where you, you think you know a fact and your buddy sitting next to you, if you're fortunate enough to get tickets, is sitting there arguing this fact and you know he's wrong, I have a very, very good way for you to fact check that situation. It's simply... WrestlingPreviewGuide.com slash JB. That will save you $5 on my Division One Preview Guide. This thing has been available for pre-sale. Basically, it sells it. When you get your hands on this thing, you're going to start swiping through it with your phone or your tablet, or you're going to click through it with your computer, and it will become available March the 13th. I cannot produce it without the list of the qualifiers. So once the qualifier data comes out, I sit there, I crunch the numbers, I run things, I pull all sorts of stats and reports. You will not be able to find anywhere else. Nobody, and I repeat, nobody in the history of the sport of wrestling has put in this much time for something that I am doing specifically for you. ESPN gets to use this. I use this as the PA announcer for the NCAA Division One Championships. This is something I, I provide to them to I don't provide to the media. They they get a discount on it too. But the thing is, it is everything. Anybody that wants to know anything about the 2019 championships and history, who's got the most All Americans all time? Which state has the most All Americans? What what's the hometown of all these all? I have that all. That being said, wrestlingpreviewguide.com slash JB. That's my pitch. Now I want you to listen to Joey Barang. This guy's got an interesting backstory from the islands of Hawaii to California to Hawaii to coaching to, yeah, this guy's cool. He's got a story. And what they've done at Menlo is nothing short of excellent. I don't get to say this at the end of the show anymore, so I might as well say it again uh, at the beginning of the show. I'd like to thank you for spending your time with me because you've always got time for a short time. Let's meet Joey Barang. Cue the swoosh. Now up on the Short Time Wrestling Podcast, we are talking women's wrestling again. We've already talked with Sam Schmitz at McHenry about their national duels title a couple weeks ago. We talked with Ashley Short at Life about the WCWA Championship and so what they were doing to host it. Now we've come full circle. We're talking with the coach of the national champion, Menlo Oaks, Joey Barang, the first national championship, not just in women's wrestling history at Menlo, but the first national championship in school history for any sport. You know, it's got to be exciting to carry the flag and, and that banner for Menlo and women's wrestling as a whole. 
Yeah, absolutely. We're excited over here. I mean, uh, just winning our first title, there's a lot of buzz going on now. I mean, it was literally just a couple of days ago, and my phone has not stopped ringing. I've been getting text messages and, and all types of stuff the last couple of days. So it's definitely, we're still definitely on a high off of it. You know, riding that high. What's interesting, though, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the school as a whole in Manuel College out in Atherton, California. But you have an interesting background. You are born in Hawaii, raised California, went back to Hawaii. What, what got you into the sport of wrestling? Yeah, um, I, I, was, I was a kid that grew up in California, kind of a rougher neighborhood out here in California, Pittsburgh, California. And I, I grew up playing sports and uh, just doing things on the street, uh, playing basketball and football, that type of thing. And uh, one of my buddies was on the high school wrestling team, and he had told uh, Brett McNamara, who at the time was a head coach for the Pittsburgh high school team, uh, that there's a kid that um, is in my neighborhood that you might want to um, try to get into wrestling. And so I got invited from um, Coach McNamara to come wrestle. I tried out of practice, and uh, of course I got my butt kicked, and um, I was hooked ever since, basically. <laughs> Yeah, I never quite figured that out. It was kind of like I got hooked, only I wasn't very good. You must have at least been pretty good because you went on to wrestle uh, Division Two at San Francisco State for, for Coach Lars Jensen. But what was it that, that drew you to the next level, that what made you say, you know what, I want to keep wrestling beyond high school. I want to go to college and wrestle. Yeah, you know, I, I just love competition. I'm one of those guys who just, like, seeks competition. I like things that are hard. I like things that are tough. And, uh you know, after high school, I, I went back to Hawaii after wrestling here in Pittsburgh, and I was a state champion out there, and um, my, my career kind of ended, and, and, you know, I was kind of searching for the next best thing, and uh, my head coach at the time had a few calls for me, and uh, Lars called me, coach, coach coach Jensen called me and asked me, you know, if I wanted to come out to, back out to California and try wrestling again, and I, of course, I thought my career was done at the time. Um, being from Hawaii, you don't get a lot of, you know, notoriety or looks um, out in the nation unless people kind of help you. And so um, my coach really helped me with that. He called a few people and Lars called me. And, um, yeah, it was a good move. I wanted to come back to California. I wanted to do something with, with my career. And, um, yeah, that, that's how it all happened. You know, looking at that time frame, you graduated college, what, 2004? Is that about right? Yes, that's correct. That was my last season. Okay, so you got to see, you know, you're you're at that next level already when a guy named Travis Lee comes through in Fargo and, and decides to drop double golds uh, on the island. What was it like watching, you know, as, as a Hawaiian, watching what he did coming through the high school ranks and then ultimately winning an NCAA title for Cornell uh, when he got to the next level? <laughs> yeah, funny you said that. Um, Travis and I go way back. We actually competed against each other at the, at the state level. And he was a uh, competitor of mine. He actually, I hate to admit this on the podcast, but he, 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 he beat me my junior year. I'd won state in Hawaii as a sophomore, got to the finals against Travis, and I was undefeated, and I believe so was he. And he, he pretty much beat me at the state meet. And I thought, who was this kid that just beat me? Um, I think I was his first state championship against me. So he, beat, he had beat defending national champ. So my senior year, he went up to 19s. And I thought, hey, I want to go revenge him at 19s. And uh, we both were kind of headed towards each other for the, for the state meet in a rematch. And unfortunately, he did his part, and I didn't do mine. <laughs> but then, uh, you know, he, he did go on to Cornell, and he had a great career for himself. And um, he just shows well for, for Hawaii athletes. You know, it just comes to show that even if you're from a small area, that it's, it's just not about that. I mean, if you have heart and you want to wrestle and you got determination, you could be good at the next level. So um, it was great watching him do what he did in college. I had a couple friends that when I was working at USA Wrestling were, were, were Hawaiians. And, uh, you know, I, I learned a little bit about the, the, the culture. And it's it's more than what we see on television with, you know, the famed Hawaii Five O and any of those type of television shows. But, like, things like how they make Kahlua Pig and certain things about the alf <laughs> alphabet and, and, and apostrophes are everywhere. I mean, for those who, who, who are from the contiguous 48 that, that have never been out there, just describe the, the culture of, of Hawaiian people as a whole, something that people may not actually get from something other than actually either going there and experiencing the culture firsthand. Yeah, you know, you're gonna, you're definitely gonna feel the aloha spirit, is what we call, and um, the welcoming, the family atmosphere, the food, the, the gathering, the ohana, that right? And culture, the ohana, correct. That's the family. Um, but what you might not see unless you grow up there is, um, you know, how how 
how, uh, you know, we, we just kind of try to, we're, we're fighters and we, we come from a small area where you run into each other's turf, um, so to speak. And, and, you know, we defend our area pretty well and we like that competition and we're, we're warriors, you know, and when you live on the Island, you understand that if you come and visit, you might not necessarily see that before you experience the Aloha first. Usually it takes a little while before you start to see, man, these guys, they don't give up. They're fighters. They, they scrap for everything that they have. And, and that's, that's the Hawaiian culture. That's what we do. It just kind of, kind of lends itself well to the combat sports. Now I'm curious on how soon after your, when your college career ended at San Francisco state, did you decide, you know, coaching, wrestling coaching is what I want to do. Yeah, immediately. Um, I was, I was asked by coach Jensen to help him coach wrestling at the, at the college level for the men. So, um, I did that for two seasons. Um, I had a degree in kinesiology. So after the two seasons of wrestling, I decided to, uh, get into my field of personal training, strength and conditioning, that type of thing. Um, and I never really stayed away from it. I got into the high school, uh, here, here in San Francisco at a Reardon high school. And I helped coach for four years there. I was a strength and conditioning coach, but I also helped with the wrestling team. And then, um, shortly after that, I got called by coach Keith Spataro, who's our AD at Menlo. So, so I'm curious when the call comes from Co- uh, from Coach Spataro. Ah, Spataro, let's try that again. You know, he's the AD. He was the previous wrestling coach, and then moved into the administrative role. Did the hiring of the other coaches. But uh, I'm guessing when the women's offer comes, this is not something that's completely unfamiliar to you because Hawaii has had girls wrestling state championships for a while. You know, California has been churning out Fargo champs left and right. So uh, when the call came, I mean, were, were you uh, hesitant at all about coaching women's wrestling or what, what was that scenario like that said, yeah, you know what? I- I'm going to coach women's wrestling. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, I did hesitate. Of course. I mean, I, I had never coached uh, women's wrestling before and I knew that it was, I, I knew that it was a new growing sport. And so in, in my, in my experience, I didn't really have that experience having those athletes in my belt. But, you know, speaking of Hawaii, um, my high school, Moanalua High School, uh, which is located on the on the main island in Oahu, uh, we were, when, when women's wrestling started in Hawaii and they sanctioned women's wrestling as a sport, we were the school that were the first three-time state champions. So I literally uh, pretty much went to high school with some of the best girls in the country. And in fact, a lot of those girls went on to be on the U.S. world team. And um, I want to say Stephanie Lee, who was my teammate at the time, I think she competed for the United States in, in the Olympics. Uh, Clarissa Chun used to come by to practice it. She was, she was at a different school, Roosevelt, but she would come after school and practice with our team because we had, we had the largest team in the state of Hawaii. So I wasn't unfamiliar to it. I actually, I actually knew – um, about women, women wrestlers and how they reacted to certain things. Cause they were my, some of them were my best friends. So I, I think I had a little bit of an edge in that, in that regards. And that helped me decide whether or not I wanted to actually coach them. When we look at coming into Menlo, the program of uh, the first women's coach, there was Lee Allen, who was an Olympian. And, uh, you know, he, you know, he's, he's since passed on, but he was inducted into the national wrestling hall of fame. Uh, posthumously a couple years ago, but you know, his widow, Joan Fulp is, is battling and working with high school state associations through USA wrestling to get girls wrestling sanctioned as a sport nationwide. But, uh, you know, as you come into that position, it was Lee Allen. It was Marcy Van Dusen who was on, you know, on the Olympic team and Bill Mitchell for a year. Then you get that job. I mean, there's, there's a lot of name recognition before you got a couple of Olympians predating you there in the coaching position, but the, 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 the legacy of that program has basically been Catherine and Sarah Fulp Allen, the only national champions that the school had had, uh, combining to win five of them. So, you know, what's it like to try to carve out your own presence in, in Menlo's uh, and expand Menlo's wrestling legacy when, you know, the Allen name and the Fulp Allen name has been so, you know, associated with it over the years? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I knew about that history. And uh, when I got recruited by Coach Fataro, he had mentioned these things to me. But at the time, you know, we, it was either, it was all or nothing. You know, they were seeking for a coach that could possibly do this. And I had, I, I had had to basically the time to commit to possibly doing it if I was going to, if I was going to do it. And so again, like I said from before, you know, I'm super competitive. And uh, when you call me up and you say, Hey, you know, we're ranked dead last. Um, do you want to, I want this opportunity. This could be a great thing going down, but it's going to take you some time. 
I mean, right away to me, I think to myself, well, if we're at the very bottom, the only way to go is up. So um, I love challenges. Like I said, I didn't really feel any pressure to, you know, uh, compare myself to anybody. It wasn't, it wasn't that it was just more of, Hey, can you go from zero to hero? You know, that's a challenge for you. Do you want to try to, do you want to take on that responsibility? And of course the answer was yes. It seems like it's not just the women's program there. Joey Martinez has done a stellar job at really making Menlo a national power, a national name on the men's side too. How do you and coach Martinez coexist as, you know, coaches of, of respective teams under one wrestling program? Yeah, you know, me and Joey have worked really well over the years. You know, at the beginning, it was hard, you know, trying to figure out who, who's doing what, you know, how, how do I, how do I, how do I, how do I build this program having, you know, him there to help me? How do we use each other in the right ways? And I just think over the course of time, and we communicate really well. I, I just remember my first couple of years, literally just calling him every day and trying to meet him at his office when I got off of my main job, going to see him. And uh, our relationship just has built over the years. And I think he trusts me 100% with what we're doing. And I trust him with what he's doing on his side. And so um, when, when you have trust and you got good communication, um, then it becomes dangerous for other people because now you got two heads versus one going at it. And, and what about having the support of an administration? You know, your AD was a wrestling coach. That's that's an abnormal situation, really, in the landscape of college athletics. You've got a guy that's the head of that athletics department that, you know, he's a wrestling coach. He wants wrestling to succeed. Probably, uh, you know, he w probably won't admit that he wants to, to win more than other sports. But, you know, that's that's where he's coming from. So what's it like to have to uh, sit there and work with Keith? Yeah, it's 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 um, undescribable. It's enormous. You know, it's uh it's the reason why I knew that it was going to be successful because, you know, support is everything. And when you know that your AD has your back, uh, when you come to him and say, Hey, I'd like to admit this kid. I know that the grades don't look a certain way or, or, um, I know that it, I know that she doesn't come from, uh, the family doesn't come from a wealthy family or things like that. You know, at least that he's going to understand that you're trying to win and you're trying to build this thing. And so that, that is, was huge for us in the beginning. Um, and just being able to just know that he, he has our support, he understands wrestling, um, it, it just helps out. It just helps out a lot. Now, we, we get to this upcoming performance. I mean, this this has been a couple years in the making. You said you did, you couldn't go anywhere else but up. But what really helped start build the foundation to, to, to bring Menlo from, you know, kind of an also ran in the world of the young world of women's collegiate wrestling to, you know, not just a national contender, but a national championship? Mm-hmm. You know, it was the, it was my first year, you know, it was the first couple of recruits that, that I brought in that first season when I went out and recruited. And I believe we picked up 13 girls and I won't say the names, but at the time the highest recruit was maybe like a fourth in the state of California or something like that. And that was our biggest deal. And, you know, everyone else was kind of sixth or, or not placed and that kind of thing. And we, we had a group of girls that believed in the vision that was years down the line. And um, they stuck with the belief of one day we're going to be national powerhouses and we just have to keep going through the process. So I think each and every year from that year on, uh, we've been able to build off of the success of the year before. Um, and I think that if, you know, any one of those teams starting six years ago um, would have you know, quit or dropped out or not as not as placed this high, not have shown growth in the program. I don't think we win the national championship this year. So really, you know, it, the gratitude has to go to those girls who committed themselves early on to not quit. You know, to see me walk in the room and go, okay, here's your first, here's your new coach, and just not walk out of the room and go, all right, let's give him a chance. Um, my hat goes off to those girls. You know, this, this is, those girls are the re real reasons why we were able to re recruit such a, such a strong crew going forward. So that's what I would say. When we look at a coach taking over, you know, Rob Cole over at Cornell, let's, let's throw Cornell back in the mix here. You know, he had been a, at Cornell for almost a decade before he really started getting hammer recruits and getting one All-American a year, two All-Americans a year. The next thing you know, you're getting four All-Americans a year. Uh, you know, it, it's a little different on the Division One men's side of things, but we look at, you got nine All-Americans this year. I mean, there's four, there's six, but getting nine, getting in a position to have three champions, getting in a position to win a team title, 
it's usually the second or third recruiting class that really once they come through and have, have made the difference. And and you started off this recruiting class with a bang. Two of your two of your champs were highly regarded freshmen that were were basically had the pick of the litter where they wanted to go in terms of which college if they wanted to go OTC they've got the credentials. How did you land Aleda Martinez and and Gracie Figueroa to come to Menlo College? Yeah, <laughs> and I won't give a, give away too much of our secrets, but I will say this: we 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 had known about Gracie and Aleda um, pretty much my first year I started coaching. Um, they have. Uh, a club coach that works with them. I wouldn't even say that. It's more of a family member that that is, he's he's a Menlo alumni. His name is Isaac Pumarejo, and he let me he he got me aware of the girls uh, six years ago. And he had said, "Hey, you know, I got these girls. They're they're good, blah blah blah." And I go, "Well, what grade are they?" And I think I remember him saying at the time they were like in seventh grade or sixth grade or something like that. I'm like, "All right, well, we've got a ways to go." And so, of course, of course, you know, as time went by, you start uh, noticing their names out. You know, they beat these boys. They won this tournament, that type of thing. And when they get to high school, now their notoriety starts to pick up. So we had been in the conversation or at least looking at what they have been doing prior to um, the actual recruiting day. And, um, you know, when it got closer to it, we just started to contact them and say, hey, you know, obviously we're interested um, and I think the big thing was um, being able to prove that we could, you know, house those type of athletes at our school. We had always believed that we know what we can do here. I know what I can do as a coach. We know we know what we can offer and what we can support. But um, really being able to do that for such high caliber athletes like themselves, it, you can say all you want, but you have to prove it. And I think on uh, particularly Gracie's. A recruiting class when she came on a recruiting trip um she knew right away that there it was a room full of kids that could actually wrestle with her and it wasn't just fabrication or you know yeah well menlo's been doing well over the past years can they really wrestle i think she did feel that and i think if she didn't um she wouldn't be here um i really feel like she would have gone somewhere else that um would be able to you know support her but i think she felt that and um that was a big reason we were able to sign her. Now, obviously, Aleda, in the same situation as Gracie, uh, when she came up on her trip, uh, I think she was she had an ankle sprain at the time. But um, you know, what's good for Gracie may be good for me. So it was one of those type of deals, and um, we got lucky. You know, there's some there's some luck to that, but but also too, you know, we we did build the foundation. And one of the things we told the girls when they were getting recruited, we said, hey, listen, we're going to win a national championship with or without Gracie Figueroa and Aleda Martinez. So it's just up to you guys if you want to be here, because we can make this easier if you do sign. And I, and I don't know if that was the icing on the cake or what, but we did feel and we do feel like our program is not based off of any one or two individuals. Um, it's a full team. It's a full team race. And we proved it this weekend that every single match mattered. I think we, I think we won the tournament by one match, literally. Yeah, it was it was pretty close because you had Simon Frazier in there, McKendry in there. You know, Simon Frazier had won a title before. Uh, long, good wrestling tradition there uh, up up north of the border in Canada. McKendry, of course, has been coming on. They had a great season winning the national duels. But when we look at you know the other names in there, I mean, Solon Piercy, she's a national champion now, three time All American. I really first saw her kind of emerge, you know, as an All Star Classic appearance, and I'm like, okay, you know, who is who is she? And she had a, a phenomenal jump from fifth last year to first this year. What what was the difference with her improvement? Oh, just mindset, just straight up mindset. I think I think she is starting to come into her own now and believing what she can do. Um, she's understand she's understanding wrestling at a different level now versus the last couple of years. She's always had talent. She's always had success. Uh, but I really feel like this season, um, with the way that our room was, I mean, it was just different this year. We we all believe that we can get this done, and um, from the get go. And I think that 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 spread, that feeling spread amongst all of the kids in the room, uh, and especially her. You know, we announced her as being uh, one of our captains this year. Uh, she knew she had a lot of expectations to do well this year, and she was just dialed in from the beginning of the season. I mean. I'm really excited for her future because, to be real, she she just started to kind of come alive now. And, um, yeah, she, she's going to get better. 
And looking at the dynamic of the team of the nine All Americans, you get seven back as you got two seniors. Iman Kazem ended up uh, runner up, three time All American. Heba Salem also uh, finishing fourth. You know, San Francisco native there. What did those two young women mean for this program? Well, uh, I mean, everything. I mean, again, they're a product of belief. Um, four years ago when we said, hey, we want to win a national title in one of the years that, before you graduate. And I'm so happy we got it done for the two of them because um, they're, Iman specifically is, is a product of a state champion out of California. And I, I, I want to say, yeah, she was my first state champion out of California that I recruited. So she had to have more belief than most people. Again, she was somebody who could have gone anywhere she wanted. And um, she believed in the coaching staff. She believed in uh, the dynamic that we had built with that first class, that second class that we had there, uh, the team dynamics. And um, me and my assistant coach, Marcus Randolph, we, we say this all the time. It's easy to recruit when your kids sell the program for you, you know, and, um, and that's what we do. We bring kids on campus and we go, hey, hang out with them. You don't believe us? You talk to them. You ask all the questions you want. You do whatever you want to do to fill out if this is a place for you. And if it makes sense, you'll be here. And if it doesn't make sense, we'll help you go somewhere else. And that's the verbiage we use. And um, it's, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. We built a, a, a nice culture that kids want to come here to study and, and wrestle hard. And um, it just means a lot for, for us to get it done with the two of them. And uh, them being three-time All-Americans, you know, the both of them had uh, rough junior years. You know, Hiba, Hiba did not play last year at Nationals, and, and Iman uh, messed her elbow up a couple of weeks before Nationals. And unfortunately, you know, they both had the experience a year off the mat and or a year not being an All-American and having that taken away from them for whatever reason. And for them to come out their senior year to finish strong like the way that they did, um, both of them having an amazing tournament and literally we win because they're on fire. You know, it's again, like I said, we won by one match. Any one kid doesn't do what they're supposed to do. One match, or we're behind Simon Fraser by one. So. And question, I, I probably should know this, but I don't California high school, the CIF girls state tournament. That is folk style, correct? That is folk style. Correct. Okay, so that does. So I, I, that's what I assumed. I just didn't. I might as well ask the question because if I don't know it, you can correct mm -hmm. me. The coaching styles of going from mm -hmm. being a, a high school coach, being a college coach on the men's side that wrestles our, our our collegiate, our folk style system, to now having to coach women's freestyle wrestling. I mean, what what was your freestyle background, and and what's it been like for you and your your coaching staff to to coach freestyle full time here? Yeah. Oh man, it's been amazing. I love freestyle. Um, to be to be honest with you, I'm not a big freestyle guy. I didn't I didn't go in and learn. Um, I wasn't a big throw or anything like that. But w one of the things I I did notice about the sport is um, teaching the basics is going to go a long ways for you. You know, and and wrestling is wrestling, whether it's freestyle or folk style, or greco, whatever. And you got to give them a stance. You know, you got to hand fight. There's just certain things that needs to happen in order for you to be successful. And I, I saw that early on. And although I hadn't coached wrestling or had limited experience, even wrestling at the freestyle level, I was confident that I could still do it. Um, it it's been a transition. I'm learning every, every year. And um, trust me, coaching boys or men is absolutely different from coaching young ladies. And um, I wouldn't trade it for the world. People ask me all the time whether I would move on to coach a men's team or do this type of stuff. I tell them, no. This is my. This is where I'm at right here. I'm coaching women. This is. This has been the best six years of coaching of my life, and this is literally all I've done. I'm 37 now, and this is all I've done. I mean, literally, just sports, and uh, my job has been sports and um, coaching. So uh, the transition was the, the first year was uh, there was a learning curve, but uh, I think along with all of the other coaches in the country, everyone's learning. You know, this is relatively new. We're growing so fast that I don't think anyone has this nailed down 100%. And so we're all learning together. And to me, I view that as a, an even playing field, if that's the case. We look at the school. And last I, I checked, it's under enrollment, uh, excuse me, it's undergraduate enrollment, struggling with words here, was about 745. And a lot of these 
young women on the team went to high schools bigger than that. How do you recruit mm-hmm. to you know Silicon Valley? It is a business school. The reputation for men, Menlo graduates to go on to work at Google and, and those type of businesses that are out there is, is super high, super good. What is the draw beyond wrestling? Because you know there's there's degrees to be had here. You're a student athlete, especially at schools like Menlo and you know the NAIA and those type of programs, but what is what is the draw? What makes it attractive to want to go to school at Menlo College for an athlete? And how do you sell it? Yeah, um, you know, we're in the heart of Silicon Valley. And um, Silicon Valley is the new Rome, you know. And uh, some of the best companies in the world, Google, Facebook, Apple, Yahoo. I mean, I can go on and on about the Fortune 500 companies that are in our backyard. So right off the top, right there, and we specialize in business. It's not like we have, you know, a hundred different degrees where we're spending our energy in different areas. Every single professor on campus, every single staff member, everybody, including the coaches, we're all business minded. So if that's the case, you're really specializing in a thing called business in a business area. And so we talk about that a lot with the parents and the and the kids, and we talk about um, business being universal. You know, you can take business anywhere. You can do business over the phone. You can do, we're doing business right now, right? It's like, um, so So that's what we do. You know, we recognize that we're an expensive school and um, the most expensive college at this point that has women's wrestling to attend. Uh, but one of the things that I say, you know, if you want excellence, it comes with the price. And so if, if wrestling lines up, if school lines up for you and the major lines up, then Price should just be a matter of value. Do you see value in yourself? Do you see value in what you see here? The next four years of your life, you're going to um, be rubbing elbows with some of the greatest minds in the Silicon Valley. So um, I don't know what parent wouldn't want to do that. You know, so that's what we do. That's what we talk about. We just talk about the facts. We talk about what we do. And uh, we let the kids decide. We let the parents decide whether or not that was right for them. And in a lot of situations, it doesn't work. And we're okay with that. But, you know, in recruiting, you have to go through, uh, you have to collect no's as well as yeses. So we, we understand that every 10 no's comes with one yes. And uh, all we need is a few girls every year. So we just have to do our diligence. The three champs you had this year are the first champs, again, in school history, not named Fulp Allen. You know, Sarah won three, Catherine won two uh, in their college careers in the early years of the WCWA, starting back in, in the very first championship in 2004. Is it nice to see that there are there are wrestlers now that are coming through that are helping the school create its own legacy? Say, you know, we have now jumped levels. You know, you hear about athletes jumping levels. Now we've got athletes that aren't happen to be daughters of, of, of a legendary coach. You know, you've got athletes that yeah. have come through a system. They have grown up with girls and women's wrestling being available to them. The first junior nationals was in 2002, I believe, 2001, 2002. And, you know, these that, that's the year a lot of these athletes are born as they're coming into college. Mm-hmm. And they, they don't know any different. What's it like to, to have a whole culture of high school age girls going into college that have known they've been able to wrestle their entire life? Yeah, it's amazing. You know, it's amazing to to be able to see the the sport grow this way. Um, and when I was first starting, and it was literally six years ago, um, you you seen a handful of them, like a few, you know, and you can see it. Like the, the you get to the finals, and one girl, two girls, or three, you would just know which ones had been wrestling for a long time, or you know, which families kind of knew about the sport way ahead of time. But now it's just a lot different. Now it's you're right. It's just getting to the point to where there's generations of, of kids that like been wrestling ever since they were five. And so it's just amazing. You know, it's just an amazing thing to watch the growth of, of wrestling, men, women, boys, girls, it doesn't matter. Just to see kids getting into, you know, I say this all the time and I'm sure a lot of other coaches around the country say wrestling is wrestling is America's martial art. And um, to just see it grow like this, um, and, and knowing that there's going to be a lot more Americans in this world that are learning the discipline that we've gotten to learn. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Looking at the dynamic here, roster, 24 of the 31 that are listed on the website from California, eight of your nine all Americans are from California. But if you look throughout the course of the place winners, there are what, I just ran the numbers. I think there were 20, I think it might've been what, 22. 
Uh, 23 All-Americans from the state of California this year. Eight were yours. That means all these other schools are coming into the Golden State to try to cherry pick and recruit the best talent away. How much more difficult is it going to be now or how much easier is it going to be now to keep those young girls uh, that are looking on to the next level in state to become the next level uh, of women's wrestling? Because it's only getting more competitive in California and the wrestling is getting better. They're winning Fargo titles left and right. But, you know, th- there's a bullseye. Uh, there's a red marker circling California going, get girls from this state. Yeah, that you know, that's a good point. The answer is I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen this season, next season, or what, and how competitive everyone's going to get with recruiting. Um, I'd like to believe that uh, people are going to understand that you got to come out here to recruit. I mean, I, I literally think last year every single school was at the state meet in California. Um, but one of the things that has opened up for us now, um, six years ago, I, I would tell kids that that I was from Menlo College, and they would just they would just turn around. They would say, no, thank you, and just turn around. And that's literally what I what I had to experience at, at day one. Um, but it's different now. Now, now. now families and schools and coaches and, and, and athletes are understanding that there's a school in California that can compete for a national title. You know, and, and I don't no longer need to leave to be on the best teams in the country. I can just, in my own backyard, if I want to be home, close to home, driving distance, for Thanksgiving or Christmas or, or whatever, whatever the case may be, uh, spring break, I don't have to pay for a $500 flight anymore. I could just drive home every, every so often. And, you know, that's a big draw because it, when you're a freshman going to college, you know, you get lonely sometimes after, in your first year. No matter where you go, no matter how good your college is, no matter what type of experience you're getting, you're going to miss your family. You're going to miss your friends. And so... The ability to just go home whenever that happens to you is priceless. So now that now that people see, well, hey, Menlo's got their first national championship, you know, that's not so bad of a school to go to. <laughs> so that's how we look at it. I'm talking about your scheduling a little bit. Being out on the West Coast, and we've we've seen women's programs added out there. Uh, you know, Providence has got a program, Southern Oregon, Eastern Oregon, but there's there's really not a whole lot in terms of dual meets that you're available to get to. Uh, you didn't go to the national duels this year. You only had one dual meet. Actually, Emmanuel from, from Georgia came out to duel you guys out there. But, you know, what what went into your scheduling strategy this year as far as loading up the tournaments and having very, very limited, my limited right now we meet one dual meet? Yeah, it's difficult. You know, uh, we have to fly everywhere, travel far to get competition. And so um, what you just make do with what you have, you know, and, and we try to... We try to space out the tournaments. We try not to, um, you know, budget. You have to keep budget in mind. You have to keep um, uh, your scheduling and your your peak your peaking in mind, and all this type of stuff. You have to plan out. So it hasn't been easy, you know. And I think every year um, the tournaments change, and you know, adding the addition of the NAIA kind of threw another wrench in the in the mix, and. Um, it's it's difficult every year, and you know we run our Menlo Open uh, during uh, the first week of January, which is just coincides with National Duels, and so you have to decide certain things, and you have to kind of look at what kind of team do you realistically have. You know what's it, what's an important thing for you to go to? Which ones aren't? Which ones can we get away not doing? And I don't know if we have that nailed down all the way, but we just do we do the best we can. I, I think it's more. Um, budget based and anything. Um, but for what I can say is, you know, it was a very close race. We did win the national title. And um, even though we want to do this in a better fashion next time, um, we, we can't be dissatisfied. We got it done with what, with what we had. So there is no excuses. You got it done. So if that's the case, you should be able to do it every year. So um, we would just like to see more colleges pop up and that would make things a lot easier. Um, in order, in terms of schedule and budgeting, that type of thing. But for now, you know, it, it is what it is. We pick and choose, and we adjust our practice schedules accordingly. And again, I won't won't dive into that or anything. But um, we feel pretty confident with what we got going on so far. Actually, I do got to correct thing. You had two dual meets this year that I that I was able to track. So sometimes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes tracking down women's college wrestling scores it can be a bit of a, a laborious experience. Now. You, you mentioned the the NAIA championships, and now if we look at the team scores from the WCWA, 
Uh, there, Menlo will be there, first place. But number two, Simon Fraser. Number three, McHenry. Number four, Manuel. Number five, King will not be there because they are in CAA schools. Then we got Campbellsville, Oklahoma mm-hmm. City, Wayland Baptist, University of the Cumberlands, Jamestown. That's rounds out the top ten. So uh, the power schools that you were battling with aren't going to be at the NAIs, even though this the NAI championships, which will be the third weekend at the University of Jamestown in between the Division Three Championships and Division One Championship weekends. So if you're wondering where they are on the calendar this year, that's where they're at. Uh, Shauna Kemp running those that, that event with Jamestown. And, you know, is, is there an expectation to go in? It's like, okay, we won the bigger tournament right now. Or is it something you got to stay focused for the next month? Say, you know, we won one title. Um, people are going to come out there and want to snatch, snatch that second title away from us. Yeah, you know, you said it correctly. Um like I said before, when they announced the emerging of the NAIA, um, I immediately, as a head coach, went into a little bit of stress because I had to, I had to figure out what to do with our schedule because obviously I didn't want to leave anything on the table. We we had planned to win both of these things, um, and I know it's a difficult task and all that, but we we had talked about winning both of them from the beginning of the year, so. Um, don't get me wrong. It was incredible last weekend going in, winning, winning the tournament the way that we did and all that. But, man, our sights have been set on two of these things. And so that's what we're trying to do this year. And we're, we want to be able to be to say that we were the first team to win the NAIA. Um, and we don't know what the future of the WCWA is, is going to be happening for next year. I mean, we're hoping it's still around and it flourishes more, but you just never know. So you, if you have the opportunity sitting here in front of you, why not take them both? And we knew it was going to be a tough goal from the beginning. So far, we're 50% there. We got one of them down, and um, our kids are ready to go. They're, they're, they're not going to take any match lightly. I have some kids that did an All-American that, that worked really hard this year and, de- and really deserved to sit on that podium somewhere, and they didn't get it done. So this is a rare occasion where um, a wrestler gets redemption, and you have a chance to now reconcile um, what you maybe didn't do at the WCWA is, and that's how we're looking at it. And then the other thing, the other side of the point is, well, the nine of you got it done. Can, how, can we have, can we punch 10 to the final? Can we punch all of us to the finals at the NAIAs? I mean, we just create a new goal. When you look at the future of women's wrestling, you got to look at the past a little bit. What has made California kind of the, you know, the Petri dish of greatness, so to speak, with girls wrestling in Fargo, women's wrestling at the college level. I mean, why are there so many successful wrestlers? What is the enticement in your eyes for young women to the sport of wrestling? Yeah, I just think it speaks high volumes to the state of California. And what what we've done over the years with the men's wrestling and boys wrestling, I mean, we're really one of the most competitive states in the country. Um, you got the Central Valley, you got uh, the Southern Section, you got the North. And, I mean, everyone battles on the men's side. And if you look at the Division One NCAA level, um, there's there's consistently kids that come out of California all the time and sign to the big schools and do well, and that type of thing. So that that has always been there. And if you think about the population of California, it's, it's huge. Uh, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but we may be the largest population in the whole United States. I don't know that, but I'm just guessing. And, and, you know, just as much as you have boys, you have girls. And so um, I think once, once, once parents started figuring out, hey, why not make my daughter a piece? Why not put her into wrestling? Once they started seeing that, um, that became more of a thing for everybody. And then they figured out, you know, you can have just as much of success, if not more, with the, uh, with the, um, with the women. So I think that's, that's been a huge contributor. There's been some some rumors shuffling about the the California Junior Colleges looking at starting uh, women's wrestling, and they've got 22, I think, men's programs that compete in the in the fall semester. A move like that that would open the doors for a lot more of these high school girls to go on to college, at least in a, in a two year situation, and then funnel them into the uh, the NAI, the WCWA, the NCAA schools. I mean, how beneficial for you as a coach would it be to say, "All right, California Junior Colleges, you guys got women's wrestling now." Yeah, that would be that would be amazing. I mean, we we had thought for a second that this year would be the first year that they were going to come out. Um, unfortunately, it's taken a little bit of time, and I don't know what the time frame for their emerging is going to be. But um, that would definitely help a lot of kids 
Um, you know, like I said, a lot of times you go to recruit somebody you really want and uh, maybe their grades are not there for right now. The junior college is the perfect, you know, stepping stool for, for a kid to get themselves going before they jump into a four-year school like ours. Um, and so if, if that happens, we're able to get more competition. We'll be able to help more kids go to college. Um, it, it would just mean uh, it would explode the sport if California got together and started the JC level. I'm really hoping that that happens uh, while I'm still here coaching at Menlo College. Moving forward, where do you see women's college wrestling in 10 years, 10 years from now? 10 years from now, I see it being one of the premier sports um, in the Olympics and in, around the world. Um, just the way that the passion that it brings out and the energy that, that the sport brings out, um, it's, I feel like it's unmatched in any other sport that, that women do. And I just see it being one of the fastest growing and the biggest sport in 10 years. I mean, it's so, if you've ever gone to a women's tournament or sat in a corner or watched watch a couple of those women go at it in battle. It is one of the most exciting things to watch. It, I, I have a hard time watching the, the collegiate level for the men these days because I'm just so used to the high pace of the fight that the women put together that, um, and, and then the tournament and pretty quick, they don't last, they don't last all the, the whole eight hours or whatever the case may be. So I, I think it's the next best thing, man. I do have a couple, uh, it's not quite a short time on short time, a segment I used to do. I, I just got a couple questions involving, uh, what's it like for you to, you know, you said your phone's been blowing up. I mean, uh, the alums, of course, uh, now Sarah Bohora, formerly Sarah Fulp Allen and Catherine Shy, formerly Catherine Fulp Allen, you know, th they're two of the names that people know with Menlo wrestling. The third is fighting in the UFC, Ashley Evan Smith, a four time all American at school. How much of those athletes really kind of helped the presence of Menlo when they say, you know, yeah, yeah, we've got, we've got women that have been on the national team. We've got women that are fighting in the UFC. Yeah. Those, those women have been amazing at our PR and just, and just getting the word out there that Menlo college is where they came from. And they, they, you know, they walk around with pride, you know, and even prior to us even doing well the last couple of years, uh, those girls, particularly that, you know, Carla Esparza, she was a random weight world champion in the UFC um, they they would represent Menlo long before we even won this national championship. So, you know, my hat goes off to them because, again, it speaks it speaks volumes to the community that Menlo College has. Um, that girls like them, even when we weren't doing well, they wore that M with pride. And now that we were able to, you know, give them that national title, um, they I'm pretty sure that they're ecstatic about everything that's happening right now. Um, but we're we're happy that they're around and they, they post things up on their social media and um, it just helps us, you know, it just helps us long term. March 15th and 16th, Jamestown, North Dakota, Menlo will try to double up and win an NAIA national championships in women's wrestling. Coach Joey Barang, been a very, I guess, educational is the word I'm looking for, educational episode here on the Short Time Wrestling Podcast. Check out. Oaks Athletics at MenloAthletics.com. And, and Joey, in the time we got left, uh, any final thoughts, any final messages you want to get across to uh, the sport of wrestling, you know, people that may not know about Menlo or just women's wrestling in general? No, I, I would just like to say thank you to um, everyone that has supported women's wrestling over the years and um, that continue to support women's wrestling. Um, continue to do that. You know, we are an emerging sport, and I think we have to strike while the iron's hot. We have to keep we have to keep pushing this sport to the highest level. We have to go out there and try to win uh, multiple uh, world championships and Olympic championships for the United States so we can get our name on the map. Um, and just keep, keep pushing the sport as much as we can. That's all. The Short Time Wrestling Podcast is proudly outfitted by Compound Clothing. Shirts, singlets, custom gear orders, everything you need. Call up Cliff and the crew at cmpteamwear.com. Hey, you know what? Did you like the show? You want to hit that subscribe button? MattalkOnline.com slash listen. Various different ways to subscribe to this show on your favorite podcatcher of choice. And if you're already subscribed and you're already listening and you love the show and you want to support this show and this network, MattalkOnline.com slash join the team. Become a team member today.